Debt is bondage. You will never, ever, ever have financial freedom if you have debt. Now, I understand there's good debt and there is bad debt. Good debt, mortgage debt, student loan debt, especially if you know what you want to be and you didn't overextend on the student loan and the amount you took out. Bad debt, credit card debt. Credit card debt is you are paying for your present day desires, oh, but your cost is going to be your future day needs. When you are in debt, you feel it. You render yourself powerless. And when you are powerless, because now if you're in debt, you need that paycheck. Don't you think everybody can feel that? You walk into an interview and you need that job because you have to pay for your debt. You need it. Your boss can feel that. They can feel your powerlessness Powerlessness repels people. People control money, therefore you repel money. When you're out of debt, when you have an eight month emergency fund, when you're being responsible, responsible with, with your, your money, money, you feel, you feel powerful. powerful. And other people, and other people can feel, feel that you're powerful. You attract, you attract people, people to you. To you. What? Guess what? You attract, you attract money. So get, get yourself out, out of debt and, and out stay out of debt. debt. The sooner, the better, the better if, if you ask me. Welcome to the Policy Circle's Move the Needle experience on financial freedom. My name is Nicole Klein, and I'm a director here at the Policy Circle, and I'll be facilitating our conversation today. Before we jump in, I want to send a special thank you to one of our network sponsors, Authentic Agility Games. They will be sending everyone who registered for our program one of their game sets. So thank you so much to Authentic Agility Games for um, being gracious about that. I also wanna send another thank you to all of our network partners who helped make this event possible. Thank you. You know, uh, achieving financial freedom is something that is near and dear to me personally. As we just heard from Susie Orman, who is actually one of the thought leaders mentioned in the Policy Circle's brief on financial literacy, debt can be crushing. And I personally had to experience this at one point in my life. And I won't bore you with all the details, but. Uh, the long and the short of it is I realized how crushing my future was when I had realized all this debt that I had. So before my 28th birthday, I decided, and I did it, I paid off my car loan, I paid off all my credit card balances down to zero, and I even paid off all of my student loan debt. Now, I know this is not necessarily the story that everyone has, and that's where the Policy Circle's financial literacy brief comes into play. In the brief, we take a look at a number of different avenues and, and areas to explore. So first, as always in our briefs, we explore the role of government and private sector. We also dive into what are the challenges on this topic and where are areas for reform. In this particular brief, we also look at how tough these conversations can be about personal finances, even with our own families. And we also dive into how do you build confidence and personal responsibility with your own financial life? Because let's face it, if we are not responsible financial citizens, how can we hold our elected officials accountable to be good stewards of our tax dollars? So we created this brief because we saw that there was a gap. We saw there was a gap in, in education on this topic. And we actually polled our audience um, before this event and asked you, do you think that you're financially literate? And here are the results. 72% uh, of you said, yes, you're financially literate. And about 30% of you said, no, or you're not sure. And um, when we look at a key statistic in our financial literacy brief, um, we see that about 70% of Americans reported uh, that they had their, they felt confident in their own financial literacy. But in reality, really the actual financial literacy rate is about 34%. If you head over to the chat, we're actually gonna pop in a financial literacy quiz that you can take so you can get a baseline and see how you compare to what you actually, whether you think you're financially literate and whether you are. And we also have this quiz um, within the policy circles brief. So we also, um, have this uh, study that was brought up in our brief. In, in 2008, um, 
um, there was a study about um, Americans and, and whether they felt that they were financially literate. Um, but there was also this um, other study about this, this, this idea of tough conversations. And about a third of, of Americans said, you know, when I grew up, talking about financial literacy was really tough. And we also asked our audience this question, do you feel comfortable discussing financial fin money, money topics within your own family? And here were those results. 27% uh, of you said that you're very comfortable. 18% of you said that you're neutral on this. And about 55% of you said that you were somewhat comfortable. So um, as, as we're looking at these statistics that you can dive deeper into in our policy brief, um, we do have some subject matter experts that we've invited to participate in our program today. So we'll be exploring the topic of financial literacy and public policy, and particularly the um, education system. And then we're going to shift our focus and our conversation more on the um, the personal finance side and your personal finance journey so you can have some key tactics and takeaways from our call today. Um, before I invite our speakers on, though, I do want to let you know we will be doing a Q&A session. Um, so if you do have some questions that just pop into your head uh, throughout the program, be sure to pop those in the chat and we'll try to address those um, toward the end of our program. So I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Scott Niederjohn, um, who serves on the Wisconsin Governor's Council for Financial Literacy. He's also been the recipient of uh, the Governor's Financial Literacy Award for a number of years, um, and he's uh, published a, a, a number of articles in economic and finance journals. So welcome, Scott. And I'd also like to invite a very special guest, Indiana State Treasurer Kelly Mitchell, who holds a number of different roles. She is a statewide elected official in Indiana, um, and you can catch her bio there in, um, in the chat as well. So very excited to have you, Kelly and Scott, with us today to talk about financial literacy and public policy. So we'll just dive right in. And Scott, this, this question's for you. There's, there's a key statistic in our brief about from the CFPB that says there's about 670 million being spent right now um, annually on financial literacy programs between the public sector and the private sector. So just given the amount of money that we're investing in these programs, how can we assess whether the current financial literacy curriculums are working and how can we assess whether they're successful or not? Yeah, thanks Nicole for, for the question and for putting this together. and. I've thought a lot about that question. I mean, that's kind of what academics do, right? Is try to measure stuff. So um, I would say a couple of things. The first would be that um, I think we've agreed that the gold standard would be to show that the, the materials or the curriculum or the programs actually change behavior. Um, knowledge is one thing, uh, and we I've done a lot of knowledge kind of things, but behavior would be, I think, the ideal. That's hard though. That requires some kind of a longitudinal study, right? It requires following a group of people to see if they actually affect their behavior. It's been done in small scale uh, research I've seen with high school kids or things like that. But the answer seems to be it's hard to imagine they're working very well because just let's just look around, right? Um, most Americans lack retirement savings. Um, I just saw a study that shows that most Americans would have trouble covering a surprise $400 bill without either a credit card or a payday loan. Um, and then even things like the vast number of particularly minority folks who are unbanked, don't eat, don't have any kind of relationship with the bank. Student loan debt, right? We had 1.6 trillion. Take that on board. That's like $32,000 per borrower. And then you give your own story, Nicole, and that's talking about payments of like $400 per student. And then of those, like 11% are delinquent. So clearly that's not working. So um the other piece then, of course, would be knowledge, right? Do Are people learning anything? And I think that's also troubling. You talked about FINRA. So their, their most recent uh, capability study found that it's actually been falling, right? From 42% uh, of Americans were financially literate in 09, and now it's more like 34%. So even though we're spending all this money, things actually appear to be getting worse. Um, I followed for years Jumpstart, this group that gives a high school assessment. So kids, what do kids know? Um, and they have never known much. Uh, they, the average score is always in the range that we would call an F, right? Well below 50%. But even that has gotten worse. Um, the most recent group 
uh, high school students it was given to scored uh, 48 percent which is the lowest we've seen since 1998 so this all sounds like just a lot of negative but I, what, why it troubles me is that we're spending a lot of money on it yet seemingly not getting a lot of results and I think one of the issues is there's some good things. You know, I think now and now many states require personal finance in high school. It's about 21 states as of today. Uh, I'm actually an economist. 25 percent, 25 states require economics. I think that's good too. Um, only five don't have state standards, so 45 do. That's all good stuff. But what troubles me a little bit is that we've seen a decline though in the states who do any kind of statewide testing of what kids actually know, um, and in general, you know, if you take things seriously, like math and reading, you generally test them, right, to see if we're learning anything. So I, I think that's a problem is that we don't really, we, it's hard for us, Nicole, to even answer your question because we haven't done the right kinds of studies or the right kind of testing to know, A, what works um, and what works where. Um, so I'd love to see more of that because I think one of the beauties of our federal system is that the states can do different stuff and we can learn from each other. So I think more widespread testing would be very helpful at the high school level. Um, so I think that's probably enough for me and I would be nice to hear something positive. So maybe I'll, I'll stop there and, and thank you. Well, you bring up some good points about the, the, the statistics that you mentioned are sort of consequences or outcomes of not having a solid financial literacy program. And so Kelly, I wanted to ask you this question as a statewide elected official and really representing a, a, a huge constituency, in your opinion, how important is it to have a society that is financially literate? Well, it's extremely important, Nicole. It's it's connected to every single aspect of our lives. You know, nearly nearly every major life decision we made we make is affected by our understanding of basic financial principles. Um, you know, this is something that, as state treasurer, I get to be part of a national conversation about. Uh, I helped found the Financial Education and Empowerment Committee within the National Association of State Treasurers. And I can tell you that across the country, treasurers make this a priority um, and we learn from each other and, you know, um, learn best practices from each other and, and learn, and Scott, to your point, what might be working, what might be moving the needle uh, and, and, and what maybe isn't. So, um, what I find is it's such a huge field. It's such a broad field that it helps um, to stay focused as a state treasurer on maybe a particular area that I could make a difference in um, because it, you know, so many entities work in this arena. So many people are trying to make a difference in this space and uh, owning what I can what comes naturally to the platform of state treasurer. Um, has been really important for me to to help discern. And I think a state's fiscal health uh, is very reliant on its citizens' fiscal health. Um, I'd have to say, you know, a statistic I came across in preparing for this is, is that only 16% of Americans ages 18 to 26 are really optimistic about their financial future. And uh, I think as a, as a public servant, it's um, part of um, my duty to help um, make that future look a little brighter uh, with some tools and education to help. Absolutely. And as you're talking about public service, um, you know, just to kind of drill down a little bit more, um, Scott, I wanted to kind of get your perspective here with the, the, the K2, K through 12 education um, component. Um, outlined in our policy brief, um, there's a survey that was conducted with 800 teachers and 90% of those teachers said, yes, absolutely, we need to have financial literacy programs in our schools. Yet 50% of those teachers who were surveyed, do they feel ill-equipped to be the ones delivering <laughs> the financial curriculum because they themselves are not financially literate. So it feels like there might be some low hanging fruit to try to strengthen these programs. So what are some steps that can be taken to strengthen the programs that currently are in schools, you know, kind of outside of the measurement piece. Yeah, I think there's a few things there. And Treasurer Mitchell made a great point. I think not only not only does financial literacy affect sort of your financial life, but even data shows that it's often a leading cause of things like family instability and divorce, right? If, if, if you can't get along on financial decisions and it's really hard to get along, uh, there's important life choices, right? If, if you feel differently. So that's why I think it's so important um, in terms of the schools, yeah, I, I think the schools are the best way to impact this because this is a multiplier effect, right? If you can train one teacher, 
They work with students year after year after year, and that can really have an imp impact. But I think the problems, as you pointed out, Nicole, we've done some studies too that show everyone thinks it's important, whether it be parents, school boards, teachers. Um, but like teachers, I, I we did a little study years ago, and and parents said they felt more comfortable talking to their kids about sex education than about financial, right? We both are uncomfortable, but the first one, they at least felt like they knew something about the second one. They felt very embarrassed by their own behavior. Right? So it's really hard to talk to them. So in the schools, though, it's the same kind of thing where never do teacher training programs include any financial literacy uh, in a university. Um, that's even true in the social studies where they would normally go on to teach these kind of things. They all, they see mainly history, sociology, education courses, I've always pushed, let's try to do a little bit of economics and a little bit of financial literacy. And the beauty of financial literacy for teachers, I think, is that not only does it help them impart the knowledge to students, but it helps them personally, right? And that's the, that's the best kind of college course is the one where you feel like you're bettering yourself and you can use it. So I think things like changing teacher training programs to include some level of financial literacy. Mm -hmm. Also, many states have very unhelpful uh, certification and licensing rules. That's true in Wisconsin that I've fought against. We have these rigid rules that say you have to have a certain license to teach certain things. So, for example, it could be in the building in a school, the most qualified financial literacy teacher might be the gym teacher because maybe he or she has just put a lot of time. It, he, they love it. They care about it, right? They, they've put side effort into it. They read about it, but they could never teach it because we have these rigid rules that state bureaucracies, uh, department of instructions often have that say you have to have a certain degree to teach things. Therefore, it turns out that maybe it's the young teachers, the, the person they saddle it with, but they don't have any passion for it or any comfortability with it. So I think that is authentic. It comes through when you're trying to teach high school students about something and you yourself aren't very confident, it's really hard to teach us. I would love to see us find ways to have the best teacher teach it irrespective of whether they have the right exact certification that the state thinks is important. And I'm only talking about Wisconsin. Of course, not. I'm sure Indiana doesn't do that, but Wisconsin has some rigid rules around that. So I think that would help. I think the schools are a key, but I think being a little more flexible and then investing in teacher training, right? I think that pays off because teachers will impact lots of students over their careers. Yeah, I think you bring up a really good point about the, the regulations that are sort of uh, dictating who can teach what is definitely a big piece of this conversation. Um, as we dive into the, the policy implications here. Um, Kelly, I wanted to ask you, you know, the, the Susie Orman opening, right, about debt and, and just this is something that impacts an enormous number of Americans. Um, and there's a key statistic in our brief that says that 80% um, of Americans have one of six types of debt. So in your opinion, just kind of drilling down on this debt conversation. How do you think this impacts the broader conversation just about fiscal responsibility? You know, for me, this one hits close to home too, Nicole, like your story at the beginning. Um, as treasurer, I have really focused on college debt because I am chair of our College Choice Savings Plan, our Indiana Education Savings Authority, College Choice 529. Um, but I myself was first generation college. And so nobody talked about saving for college. I went to college. I got a great degree. I loved it. But I paid student loans until I was 37 years old. And I can tell you that kind of debt uh, is definitely limiting. I mean, as you're trying to save for retirement, save for a home, you know, pay for school for your kids, you're still paying your loans. And I know so many people live this. And so having the honor of being chair of the College Choice Savings Program means so much to me because I advocate all the time around the state how much less expensive a dollar saved is than a dollar borrowed. And um, we have grown our program exponentially, which is wonderful. Um, we also have uh, supported a partnership called Promise Indiana uh, through the Indiana Youth Institute. And Promise goes into schools and um, as young as kindergartners are getting talked to about what do you dream about being when you grow up and how are you going to get there? And their parents are brought into the conversation. And uh, it's, it's really exciting to see that. Um, I will say as well, just a few years ago, we also started a 529A program, uh, Invest Able Indiana. And this allows people with disabilities who weren't able to save 
more than $2,000 without losing their means tested benefits. Now they can save up to $15,000 a year. And already in this program that's just a few years old, the average account balance is over $6,000. And so we're getting to raise uh, awareness of the importance of having that savings, uh, which I think is just so, so important. But, but we spend so much time on, you know, choose the college you can afford, know what your major is going to pay. Uh, your degree is, you know, what's that salary going to be and does it match? what you're borrowing uh, in order to have that experience. Absolutely. And I want to conclude our segment again, um, Kelly, just um, thinking about, you know, we talked a lot about K through 12 education and, and all the, the important work that you're doing from the treasurer's office. And there's other aspects of this that I wanted to kind of get your get your opinion on here. Um, there's a lot of I hear about a lot of different tax credit programs, a lot of incentives for trying to save for retirement early. So what do you think are some other connections between a financially literate public and public policy? Gosh, I think we're the connection. You know, you're the connection, you know, to, to Scott's point about he wants to change policy um, as regards to who can teach this subject. You know, we're the voice, we're the vessel, we're the way that that public policy is formed and created in order to impact our fiscal health. And so, you know, talking to people about the 529 program or the ABLE program or um, Smart Women, Smart Money Conference uh, that I'm really um, excited to help support through the State Financial Officers Foundation. There are mm -hmm. so many ways that financial literacy and public policy intersect, but they all come through us. They all come through us using our platforms, our voices to make a difference. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Kelly and Scott, and uh, appreciate your time on this segment about public policy. We're now gonna transition over and I'd like to invite Lorraine Gavikin Kerr, who is Managing Director at TD Ameritrade and um, has held a number of uh, executive and leadership level positions there. Uh, Lorraine, welcome to our program today. Thanks for being here. Hi, Nicole, thanks for having me. So excited to talk about this because I think as, as you can see from some of our poll results, there's, um, uh, and even from that survey with the teachers, there's just a number of people who them, they don't feel confident about this conversation. Um, and so, as you know, the title of our program is Achieving Financial Freedom. And I know you have a particular skill set here that would just be so valuable for our members to hear about. And I think when people think of financial freedom, we're really we're really talking about retirement, right? We're talking about retirement strategies. So can you tell us what are some steps that people can take to start down this path toward their own financial freedom? Yeah, I think, you know, retirement is a universal goal um, in terms of everything that we, we need to work at. And I think that to back away from that from a second, you kind of have to set out the, the here and now um, the, and the future. And retirement is a future that we all work towards. So, you know, the financial freedom means different things to different people at different stages of their lives. Um, we heard the treasurer just talk about, you know, that that student debt that was compounded by the fact that, you know, your kids are, uh, uh, you know, you're supporting them financially. Um, and then you're also just trying to, you know, live your life. So I think that the way that we define um, kind of look at this is, you know, a, a, a pyramid of needs, wants and then wishes. So that need is really what I need to survive. That kind of one piece will be I want to retire at X. I want to retire comfortably and be able to maintain, you know, a certain lifestyle. And it will differ for some people. Um, you might have people who are like, hey, I'm young, um, I'm single, I'm going to travel in my 30s and blow a ton of money every year. Other people will be like, you know, I want to retire at 55 and travel the world. So there's going to be, you know, a kind of very personal preferences and individual preferences in there. The key to retirement is everybody needs a plan. You have to have a plan. And it doesn't matter when you start that plan. I think there's a degree of um no just like you talked about in families we don't talk about this is a degree of head, hesitancy to really set that plan out and say okay what am i really talking about here i want to retire comfortably i want to be able to support myself in old age um i want to be able to deal with any health emergencies that i'm going to have um, i want to maintain my lifestyle i want to have a home somewhere you know all those different things that matter to different people so really i think the key on the, especially on the retirement fund, is having a plan. 
Um, and that plan has to be even individualized to you. What's important to you? What do you want your retirement to look like? So I think, you know, a lot of what we talk about is setting that plan, defining what's important to you and when, and then having discipline and execution. We're all going to fall off the plan here and now, but I think it's that ability um, to come back and check. And I always kind of do, you know, financial health in general. Um, compared to your medical health to how you you do regular assessments you try and have a healthy diet um for the most part you, you know you you check in with your doctor how am i doing is everything good so i think like in terms of finances and planning um you know in general but particularly towards retirement you need to set your plan you know check it from time to time regardless of if you're you know managing that retirement portfolio yourself or you're using your company's 401k or an ira i think you really need to be an active participant in your old financial health like you would be in your medical health and that's kind of how i like to look at this um and i think the one thing that we've we've kind of done is is make it uncomfortable for people to talk about this you know it, it was great to hear the treasurer talk about i'm 37 i have all this college debt people don't actively engage in conversations around that so it becomes this stigma that i you know i don't want people to know that it should be part of okay here i am and here's i'm going to get to where i need to be for me individually so that's kind of how i look at it in terms of you know it, the planning is everything and it's individualized right it depends on what's important to you and when absolutely yeah and as you're talking about the planning part and I think um, you hit the nail on the head. It can feel very overwhelming and complex. And I think when we, when people think of retirement strategies, maybe they see some uh, uh, graphs and charts with all kinds of stock numbers and things like that. Um, but we actually asked, we polled our audience um, and asked them, well, do you know how much you need uh, for retirement? And um, I would love for you to react to the results here. 50% um, said yes. And then the other 50% are unsure or no, they, they don't know what they need for retirement. And I think as we're talking about planning, it's kind of um, something that one of our founders talks about at the policy circle, have the end in mind, you know, start with the end in mind. So I would love for you to, um, you know, is this surprising to you that people don't know how much they need to retire and, and how important is it to kind of have that a, 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 a target? If yeah, you I mean, I think that, it's not surprising and I'm guessing because we're talking to, you know, a group of, you know, a very specific demographic to a certain extent that if you went into the broader public, that 50% yes is not going to be 50%, it's probably going to be a lot lower. Um, I, I think that it's not surprising and I think it's, you know, the, the, the good thing about this is, is it's easy to figure this part out. What do I need to um, have for retirement? And again, depending on all those things that you want, these are readily available free tools that you know every bank and brokerage will offer and we can post our, um, our retirement calculator at TD Ameritrade. And really what it is is asking you a set of practical questions um, in terms of when do you want to retire? Do you want to maintain your current lifestyle? How much are you saving now? What's in your 401k? So really it's a gut check and where you're at. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're 35 and you haven't saved a penny or you feel like oh the retirement calculator is telling me that i'm i'm under and over that's when you can make your plan and i need to adjust and if i and the good thing is you've got a big long time horizon you can look at that mm -hmm. and say okay i can slowly eat away at this over time um so again i think that some of the hesitancy in this is this is not glamorous it's not it's kind of you know some people get overwhelmed by finances it's like saying you know i want to lose 50 pounds i'm going to do it in six months i mean i think you need to be realistic about things like that and just that eat away at that so you get that sense of achievement that i'm i'm meeting my goals so you know for instance in your 20s and 30s you're paying down college debt is there a piece of that that I can kind of alter so that I can, you know, pay into retirement? What does my company offer in terms of 401k, um, you know, IRA savings? Um, the treasurer mentioned um, college savings, the 529 plans, the tax benefits to people of doing that. And I, I do think a lot of this, and you mentioned kind of charts and the graphs, it's overwhelming. And a lot of it is on the industry to make it um, translatable into regular people's vernacular. Now, I don't know if some of that is kind of, by nature of you know 
we don't really think of people as being able to handle this, you're your best money manager, full stop. It doesn't matter if you're relying on a 401k plan or a managed product, you still need to know what they're doing and what's important, check your returns. So I, it doesn't surprise me, but I think the good news is that one takeaway that you could take from today is I'm going to do, I, whether I have a plan, the 50% that think, you know, we're, I, I know how much I need, just gut check that often. Um, and the, the people who don't, it, just go ahead, do your gut check, um, do the retirement calculator, assess where you're at, and then kind of just do make that plan for you. Um, and sometimes the fear of inaction or fear of action kind of prevents us from taking those first steps and makes something seem surmountable when really it's not. So the, the tools are out there to do that first level. I'm going to do a gut check on where I'm at and figure out how much I need for retirement and then figure out how I'm going to get there. Absolutely. Yeah. I appreciate you bringing up just the, the tools that are out there and available for people. If this topic is intimidating and, and you're not sure where to start, we're actually going to pop over in the chat, a retirement calculator um, that Lorraine mentioned so that you can um, grab that, save that link um, and, and make sure that, that you're um, starting to take those first steps toward achieving your own financial freedom. Um, I wanted to ask you too, Lorraine, before we kind of close our, our personal finance segment here, um, and I'm really curious about your answer on this, but just given your wealth of experience and working with different people and companies, what is the biggest financial mistake that people make? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> that's a loaded question. There's a number, but I think that more or less they all come down to planning whether you have a plan or not at a basic level but then also you know are you being true to your plan are you adjusting it as needed um so i think that and you know being honest with yourself i think i think it's all around really the integrity of looking at and again i always compare it to your physical health because i think if you treat it like that you'd be more inclined to um stay tuned so i think it's all around planning staying true to true to that plan um, and, you know, using the resources that are out there are so important. Um, and I do think we've made huge strides and it. it's awesome to hear Scott and, and the treasurer talk about all the efforts that they're making. Uh, there's so much we can do in this space. And I, I, I often think, I know you mentioned about your personal situation, you know, I have, I have three young children um, and I think they thought the card in my wallet was this magic gold card that has been <laughs> Of money so i'm like what am i doing um so basically now if they get a reward they will be given an actual um paper uh, uh dollar bill or a ten dollar bill and i'm like okay you want to go and get a toy at target this is what you're working with <laughs> So, you know, my five-year-old for a while was like, why did she take my money? I'm like, this is how it works. So again, I think it, some of, you know, in, in a basic level from a financial literacy standpoint, there's that kind of what, what Scott and the treasurer were talking about, but also that kind of, um, you know, what are we doing in our own households to kind of teach people how to deal with this correctly? So again, I think, you know, back to the, the question of planning or the biggest mistakes people, I think it's just planning. Um, planning how you're going to deal with this. And it's not a nice subject to think about, you know, estate planning, end of life, retirement. I'm young. I have all this life ahead of me. Why would I worry about that stuff? Because I think I, I, an old saying my mother always used to say was time is your friend until it's not. So, you know, get on that bandwagon, get a plan out, make an assessment, an honest assessment of where you're at and then kind of move forward from there. And the good news, there's so many resources out there. Um, and I think that the industry is becoming more aware that we need to make this more accessible in terms of not just the tools and managed products, but also the knowledge around this so that people can feel more confident. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I think you bring up some really excellent points about the planning and making sure that you're, you're taking those first steps and there are tools out there. We, like I said, please reference the chat. And I think a lot of the planning starts with authentic conversations in your own families. And I encourage everyone on this call to use the policy circles, financial literacy brief as a starting point to have just these family discussions. So thank you, Lorraine. I wanna invite Scott and Kelly back on screen here. And I believe we have a couple of questions um, that have been submitted from the audience and they're gonna pop up here. So um, Scott, you touched on the difference between knowledge and behavior and practice when it comes to financial literacy. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that? And this is from Indiana MoneyWise. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I think, you know, I think a basic way to think about that would be, uh, well, think about lots of things, like history, right? If you can pass a test on history, you've probably got pretty good command of facts and, and that's great. I think financial literacy is different though, because just because 
you know what you should do doesn't mean you do it. I mean, all virtually everyone knows you shouldn't spend more than you make, go into debt, right? Everyone knows that. But it's a lot harder to do in practice than it is to talk about, right? I mean, it's uh, it's hard to uh, – the beauty of borrowing money is that all the benefit comes today and the costs come later, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like smoking or other things, diet, right? Those are really tough things for people to deal with when all the benefit comes today and you pay for it later. And that later may never come or, or it seems so far off to you. Um, so that's why I would say – we academics have been pretty good at, you know, doing control groups and, you know, teach a curriculum, see if the kids or adults, whoever, um, the, those who were treated with the curriculum, do they know more than those who didn't? And usually they do because they were taught something. And that's very helpful to know what people learn. I'm just suggesting that in this particular area, maybe different than other academic areas, behavior is what we're really going for. That is, now that you know it, do you save more money? Do you... Uh, take out a bank account? Do you uh, limit your credit card debt, right? Do you do, do you save for retirement? Like Rain was talking about, it's one thing to talk about knowing that I should, do you do it? So that's what I mean is, can you answer questions about it? That's important. Um, but more importantly, do you live the answers that you know are the right ones? That's what we would like to see in a curriculum or in a program is that we actually change uh, people's financial behavior. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that, Scott. And it's kind of um, off of what Lorraine was saying before about we all know we know what it takes to take care of our health. We we know what it takes to, to lose weight. Right. We all know exactly what we need to do. But actually doing it is a, is a whole nother whole nother ball game. So I appreciate you um, sort of uh, emphasizing that. I think we have another question here. Um, this is from Maddie. Treasurer Mitchell, you really touched on debt today. How would you encourage those who have debt to move forward and work towards paying it off? Oh, that's such a good question. It just absolutely has to be a priority. You know, it's it's tempting to do the things like with multiple student loans to um, perhaps uh, consolidate them to a bigger loan with smaller payments or things like that, but it just drags it out longer. Um, you know, I know um, family who still puts money every paycheck in envelopes and those envelopes are for exactly what they're supposed to be spent on and they stay within budget because they physically have that in front of them. And there are, I think, you know, tips and tricks like that that you can say um, that you can do that will help you. It also really helps when you have money taken out for savings before you ever get your paycheck in your hands or your, your, your checking account, when you have it automatically withdrawn and you don't ever see it and you don't have to move it to savings, that makes such a difference in success uh, in being able to save to do this. But knowing that if you spend um, something today on a credit card or you're, you're borrowing for some reason, just really sit down and figure out what is it going to cost you in the long run uh, to, to borrow that amount right now. And in that alone, I think that knowledge really can help you weigh out the cost of doing something right now versus saving for it uh, and paying it off or, or having it, being able to do it, having um, the ability to pay for it fully. Thank you for that. And, and if I could just add to that as well, um, just as I recall my days of paying off my own debt, um, I, you know, part of this is, isn't like, I'm just going to kind of sort of do this. Like you really need to make a commitment and make it a priority that you are going to do this and you're going to be consistent about it and you're going to get intense about it. So I just want to say like, don't just kind of say, oh, I'm going to kind of sort of do it. Just go for it and do it. All right, we have another question here from Mary. The brief notes that parents are more likely to emphasize budgeting with their daughter and investing with their sons. What are some tips to prepare my girls early for a confident financial future? Um, Lorraine, I would love for you to address this because you've probably worked with a lot of clients, um, maybe on this area in particular. Yeah, this is this is an interesting one because I think it's it goes beyond that financial literacy microcosm into kind of traditional gender um, roles, etc. Um, I think that you know parents should 
there's a there's a kind of a microcosm here that we're we look at in terms of and scott kind of touched on this it's literacy among children and adults so the assumption is that you know parents have all the equipment to kind of help teach their kids about i i, I think that I think now we're in a better place in terms of there's more access to information. Um, people can, can teach their kids all the same. But I think that I think that's a historic kind of emphasis on gender norms. Well, are girls really going to invest in the stock market and actively, um, you know, manage? The, I think that that's something that's moving, you know, the opposite direction. But it's generational, right? How many women are in finance? I see that every day. I sit at a table, and let's just say I'm I'm in the minority by a, a long shot. So I think that you know, as more women become involved in in the space, I think that these things will change. So, you know, I, I tend personally, and maybe it's because I'm in the space to say, it doesn't really matter. I have two girls and a boy and they all get the same treatment across the board. But I think that, you know, maybe acknowledging that, and I think it's good it was called out in the brief is that really there should be no difference, right? It's not like, you know, girls save, boys invest. Like that's completely, um, that's not something that it happens, but it's something we should call out and consciously try to remove that bias from our thinking when we're interacting with our kids, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, thank you. I, I think that concludes our questions that we received here. Before we conclude our program, though, um, I would love to hear from each of our speakers here. Um, what is one thing that someone on the program today, one of our Policy Circle community members, can do to further engage on this topic? And uh, Kelly, I'll start with you. Well, um, one thing. Okay, one. I'll narrow it to one. But um, I mentioned earlier the Smart Women, Smart Money conferences. Uh, these are, we were supposed to host this in, in Indiana this year, but I'm sure we all understand why we didn't actually get to host a conference. Uh, but these are a free one day conference um, for some of these have 800 to 1,000 women attend. And, and it just runs the spectrum of um, issues for financial education from investing in retirement to saving for a house to just, you know, just a huge um, um, arena of, of all the choices that we face. Um, and they're very empowering. They're wonderful. There will be four states that should be holding them this year. Um, if you go to smartwomensmartmoney.com, you'll be able to see those four states. And if you're able to go, if you're able to encourage others to go, if you're able to help sponsor them, uh, I would just encourage you to to get involved. Our Indiana's own Tamika Catchings often headlines these. Uh, and so we're really proud to have that relationship with her. There's also a Smart Women, Smart Money magazine that is free to the public. So if you're interested in that, again, sign up for that uh, through Smart Women, Smart Money. Awesome. Thank you. And Scott, what is something, you know, especially for talking about K through 12 education, there's a lot of parents on this call. So what are some ways that they can engage? Yeah, I was thinking about that. I think you, one thing would be just find out what's going on in your local school district. So what are they doing? So, um, you know, do they require a financial literacy course? Do they require um, that it be taught some other way? They require testing. And I think, keep in mind, and I think we all have to acknowledge this, anything we take seriously in education, we teach early and often, right? We would never say start math in 12th grade or how about one class in English uh, in your junior year, right? We would never do that because we take it seriously. So then why is financial literacy so different such that if it's serious, then why don't we start early, do some stuff in K4 and K5 and first grade, appropriate stuff, and build along the way. For example, why not do financial literacy examples in math? or in reading or in problem solving. You don't have to relegate it to its own little space. So I think that the things you could, you could think about what's your school district doing, if they really are taking it seriously, it means they're probably teaching it early and often. Um, and if they aren't doing that, um, talk to the school board, find out why they aren't doing that. Because I, I would guess that almost every parent would argue, would agree that they want their students to be exposed to it and they want them to be exposed to it throughout their time. And I think there's lots of ways to do it that are experiential too, whether it be, um, you know, have a, why don't you have a school bank? Um, junior Achievement has some interesting things like a finance park where you do a reality day. Um, some teachers of little kids use a mini society where the classroom's like an economy. So you have to pay taxes, you have to pay rent for your desk, right? <laughs> but that's, cool. that's neat, right? That's a different way than it's learning from a book. So I think you could ask tough questions like if there's this stuff out there, why isn't my district doing it? Um, 
if you really want to try to have some dif make some difference in, in your local community. That's that's a great takeaway for a lot of the people on this call is to you know find out what's going on. And uh, Lorraine, what what are you what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, the, the takeaway is to it was probably twofold, right, is to get a good gauge from from an individual perspective, you know, where you're at in terms of um, your your goals and, you know, have a glass of wine, relax while you do it and ask those difficult questions in terms of you know, when do I want to retire? Do I have a plan? You know, um, you know, how long and some of the questions are difficult. How long women are expected to live for 30 years past retirement? This is what you need to to kind of and just hit those questions and have a plan and then stick to it. And I think the second piece is, as you mentioned, there are a lot of parents and, and Scott kind of touched on this too, is kind of advocating within, um, you know, your own school system, talking to, you know, your teachers and the principal about, well, what are you doing? And I, I think that, you know, parents also can, can do a lot of work in, school in terms of offering um, expertise, talking to about money. And I in my one of my daughter's class they kind of have something similar to what what um, scott mentioned um they get dollars that they can spend and you know they're redeemable for um you know time out there or time out of class for um, recess and it just gives them an understanding that there's a value to money in a, an intangible way for them so i think you know a, a lot of the is is kind of take care of yourself and then also see how you can contribute to either your family situation or your local school um and really support the work that you know scott and and the treasurer are doing in terms of we need to adopt all these great efforts in order for this to work um so i think that yeah just really be an active participant individually and in kind of the community i guess absolutely well thank you very much for for your your perspectives and insights on our call today um as we close i just want to encourage everyone to um you know leave this conversation and take action um, you know, you, whether it's taking the financial literacy policy brief and starting those conversations with your own family, or as Scott mentioned, find out what's going on in your school district, get a gut check uh, from Lorraine on whether you are prepared um, for, for um, your, your, your own retirement strategy. So um, thank you again to our speakers for joining us. We really appreciate your insights uh, for this conversation. And also another shout out and thank you to our network sponsor, um, Authentic Agility Games. You will be receiving, if you registered for this event, a free game set from them. Um, these are some great topics that you can start with. Maybe you're not ready to dive into money and family just yet. Um, but be on the lookout in your mailbox for these and also our fabulous network partners for making this event uh, possible and a reality. Before we leave, I do want to encourage everyone to mark their calendars for a couple of our upcoming events. On January 6th, we will be introducing a brand new program here at the Policy Circle called the Civic Leadership and Engagement Roadmap, CLEAR for short. And um, you'll be hearing from some of the program participants from this year. And if you are looking at trying to get involved in your community and you're not sure how to approach your school board, maybe you're not sure how to find out what's going on in your school district, you do not want to miss this program. You definitely want to join us and find out how you can start making an impact in your community. Also, January 26 will be our next Move the Needle virtual discussion, and we will be focused on healthcare. You won't want to miss that either. Healthcare was a very big topic in the 2020 election, so we'll be talking about what is to come and what we can expect uh, for uh, healthcare uh, this year. So thank you very much for everybody joining us today. We appreciate you. We believe you do have the power to make a difference in your community. So thank you for being part of our community and thanks for watching today.